me. So I'm going to try to focus a bit on like um, software design, software principle, and also like uh, system implementation principle, as as Ian said. So we're going to talk about um, generic design, accessibility in apps. We're going to talk about um, software methodology as a strategic choice. <laughs> Um, and then system and software design principles. Uh, we're gonna touch on some of the main challenges that, that I see and, and others see that we have going forward. And then we're gonna leave it up to discussion. I don't know how much time you have, uh, Christian, like roughly how much time do you have for this? I don't speak. I mean, you. it's up to you now, uh, Lars. It's yeah. your, your call now. So you okay. you will have, a, <laughs> if when people start to sleep, then yeah. you, might, you know. I'll go home, and, I'll go home, yeah. Uh, no, we don't need, I don't think, to repeat that we need to pick a larger brain because it's, it's sort of us. So this is also your 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 uh, chance to also to to give away all your your not all <laughs> your your legacy to us. So please. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hope maybe we can take a backup of uh and give it to you. Let's see. Um yeah. okay. So uh, yeah, so I mean, there's lots to be said, right? So we can't speak about everything in, in 40 minutes, but let's let's talk about a few things. So, so first of all, generic design, uh, I think, clearly has been a success factor for us, right? And I think this is nothing new to you guys. Uh, you know this, but but I would say that like having a generic design for DHS2 has really been fundamental to the success of DHS2. So, what I mean with with generic is that when we started DHS2, you know, in 2005, we had some kind of you know, difficult years in the beginning without too much resources, and then it started to kind of take off in, in 2010 in, in East Africa and, and India. Um, and when we moved from country to country in in, um, in East Africa, like Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Uganda, these countries, we, we quickly realized that things were quite similar, right? There were quite similar challenges, needs, requirements, even users, right? So so, so that kind of for, or, or triggered us to, to, to make things generic and flexible and configurable so that we didn't, you know, have to kind of reinvent the software for every country. We saw that there was a lot of potential for sort of building on what we, what we have instead of starting from scratch. We've seen in this space, in the national development space, we've seen a lot of software being made from scratch for particular projects, for particular countries and so on. I think some of the U.S. donors have, have been, been guilty of that. So. So instead of starting from scratch from every country, we, we said, okay, let's let's try to use the same software in in, in every country, um, and that of course has a lot of uh, benefits. Uh, you can you can take what's there, you can continuously improve on what you have as opposed to starting from scratch and, and losing all knowledge every time, right? Um, it also of course reduces maintenance cost overall because of this this one code base to maintain. Clearly, there's there's a more complex code base, right? So there's there's more code to be to be maintained, but I think overall it's it's a lot less maintenance cost to have one software than to have many, right? And I think also importantly is that when you have a generic software, um, then it implicitly also transfers a lot of best practices and knowledge of the space. Because <clears throat> the thing we realized was that once you kind of think through and you think deeply about some kind of problem in one country, um, and then you move to the next one and you see, you see that, okay, the, they have the same problem, you know? So instead of then having to figure that out all over, you just build on the solution that you have from other countries. And I think that also has an accumulative effect, right? So, so once you've been doing this for 10, 10, 15 years, you have accumulated a lot of solutions, a lot of knowledge, a lot of best practices with different problems, which you can then implicitly transfer to the next country. So we see now lately that when we move to, when new countries now that haven't used DHS2, there are not that many left now, but when new countries come on board like and, and just want to do aggregation <laughs> events, it's quite quick, you know, countries can get it up and running quickly and do things in a nice way because they're basically building on a lot of accumulated knowledge and solutions and best practices over the years. So, so I think that has been absolutely fundamental. This isn't a surprise, but I think it's been, been really critical. Um, and then when you talk about generic design, like what does that mean, right? What is, what is generic design? And, and I would say, and Jörn also agrees <laughs> to this, um, that there's at least two dimensions, maybe more to, to generic design. One is what we say context or, or use case or domains. So, when you make something configurable, even though we started within health and it was like health oriented for, you know, seven, eight years in the beginning, um, we still kept it open-ended in terms of domains. We didn't hard code anything to health, right? We, we kept it open-ended uh, and flexible and we didn't hard code the word health or patient. Well, we did, but we took it out uh, and we ended up with tracked into the tracked into the instance, which is this super convoluted, but, but generic name. Um, and then of course that means 
we can now use the, the system across multiple domains. And today we see, you know, LMIS, education, forestry, agriculture. Some of them we need to do a lot of work, but some of them are kind of quick and easy to, to bring on also. So, so that is one part, like to be generic, to be applicable across countries, domains, and use cases. But I would also say there's also like a time dimension, and you're not agree with this. There's a time dimension to, to generic design also, because by, by making things configurable, um, then you also allow for a lot of, for, for evolving systems over time, right? So I've seen, there, there's just incredible, like how many software in the world exists that just do the same stuff. They do data entry, they do some kind of validation, and they do dashboards and reports, right? That That's... And everything is like hard coded to a specific domain. It's hard coded variables. Everything is hard coded. So every time you want to change something, you have to go back to the developer team and, and change. And it's just incredible, like how many software like that's been built over the over the years. And I think what we've done with DHS two is to take a step back and generalize that whole whole notion of like data entry, maintenance, validation, analytics, and make it flexible and, and configurable. And and the the benefit there is that then people can actually also then evolve their configuration over time. We know that people add more data sets, they change indicators, this new pandemics or epidemics. People go from aggregate to tracker. This like people are changing the way they do data capture and data management. Um, and mostly they can do that without talking to the developers. They can configure the changes mm -hmm. themselves. So all this stuff can be done. I'm not saying all of it, but most of it can be done without needing radical changes to the software. And I think that has also been tremendously helpful. People, it's really incredible like how self-sustained some of these countries have become without need of from from the dev team so so that has been highly critical i would say okay so i just want to take a quick step back and and, and talk you through a little bit of the history of, of how we have been thinking about you know the generic design and accessibility and so on over the years so so i would say generic design emerged well even from the beginning right but i would say it really started to be the key focus around 2010, right? When we when we when we started up in East Africa and also in India, Indian states, Sierra Leone, um, and some other, South Africa, maybe that was mostly 1.4, um, where we realized sort of the power of, of generic design. Um, so in 2010, we started to think like this: like, how can we really generalize and, and make it applicable for, for many countries? In 2010, we didn't even have an API, right? The API came in. Mm. 2012, there, there was no API. Uh, there was no custom web apps. There was like everything was struts, hard coded, very hard to change and extend, right? So everything was just a, a product. There was not a platform, I would say. And of course, that made it very hard to extend it with, with new features, extensions, basically happened by forking the entire software. And I would say we saw a lot of forking, for instance, in India, where the Indian team essentially like every time they moved to a new state, pretty much they, they made a fork. So they took the entire code base of the HST and forked it and, and hard-coded like reports into the system and, and, and added things that they needed, right? Custom UIs, uh, custom imports, functionality, um, custom reports, those, those kind of things. So so that was, a, of course, like a horribly laborious process. Like it, they now have, you know, 15 dishes to, to maintain and it was not really maintainable over time. You can you can really maintain that, I would say, and, and, and not even upgrade, right? Upgrade becomes a nightmare because now you have to merge in your 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 changes to the to the master branch, so to speak, um, which is going to be just becomes more and more complicated over time. And this is like a problem that many people have. Like SAP is also famous for this, right? Every time someone upgrades SAP, it's not the same nightmare. So so then we started to think about like how can we make an extension point? I think Ula and I. Ula and I had a famous uh, discussion. I remember smoking a water pipe in uh, in in Zanzibar, I think, and discussing like how could we, you know, expose some of these things that we have in DHS2 so that other people can take part of it. So in 2012, and we also had Morton join in 2011. And as you know, like Morton is a API guru, so he he really made a huge impact there. Started to build out the API. Um, and in 2012, we had like a basic API up and running with some you know basic metadata, data import export. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so on. And, and suddenly people could at least start to import, export data. They could build integration jobs, you know, the typical like curl scripts and things. Um, and that helps, right? That helped a lot because now you can at least, you know, do bulk imports from your own, you know, desktop and you can integrate systems in a basic way. Okay. And then over the years, we started to invest more in the API. 2016, more comprehensive API come out. Uh, and we also started to see some of the first lightweight uh, web apps being developed. So that was like the beginning of the web app development. And of course, that made it possible for people to build specific UIs without forking. So they, most of the time, when it comes came to UI, people didn't have to fork DHS2 anymore. They could build an app. Um, so that was a huge step forward. 
Um, the problem was, of course, that it's still complicated and time consuming to build apps. Like it's, you have to figure out everything, right? People had to get, sit down and people, you know, picked Angular or Vue, no, not Vue, that wasn't there, jQuery or whatever framework they knew, you know, and started to build an app. And, and all the apps looked very different, completely different style, didn't really look like these two apps. Every app had different structure, it was complete anarchy when it came to the structure. Uh, and I would say like fairly low quality apps, no consistency, common, common design principle. So, so that made it very hard, you know, to build apps. It was expensive, it's hard to maintain, and it broke all the time because when we change something in DHS2, you know, then all, all the apps broke and so on. So, so that was a step in the right direction, but still had some challenges. So in 2019, um, and I think around 2018, uh, Austin joined us and, and started to think about this app platform, which I also think was a huge uh, inflection point and a step forward. So, so with the app platform, um, in its infancy, we had now the beginning of more uniform apps, like apps were starting to be built in the same way. It put some restrictions on which frameworks, like how to build it, the structure of the app, the technology, et cetera. Um, and we started to see the quality started to go up because people were kind of guided in the right, right direction and it became cheaper to build apps because you didn't have to do all the boilerplate stuff, you know, structure and, you know, build up all these kind of services and tooling around it. Um, so that was made it move in the right direction. Still apps was kind of costly to build and maintain. It still is, right, to build. So. So what we're thinking now, uh, so this is like 2022 and, and now and, and in the future um, to address some of these challenges. What we're trying to do now is essentially to, to add more extension points to existing apps and also to build a shared and reusable UI component library so that people, app developers, they can use the app platform and they can also at some point then take this UI component library and start to build their own apps quickly made up of existing UI components and existing building blocks. Uh, instead of having to start from scratch, because like there's no point in building the, the org unit hierarchy a million times, you know, and all these selectors a million times. It's it should be almost like drag and drop. Low code is a new thing, right? No code, low code. It should get to a state where people can almost like drag and drop the components they need into place, write some kind of glue code, and then have an app without having to 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 start from scratch. And that the, the goal there is to, to kind of change the rules a bit and make it easy, affordable, and quick to build custom apps. Uh, I think this particularly relates to Tracker, right? In Tracker, we would like to um, have, in Tracker, we see a lot of the custom needs for workflows. There's a lot of special workflows. Sometimes we see a Tracker capture as being too complicated. Like there's too many features, not too less, right? Too many options, too many features. People find, you, end users find it sometimes hard to do to use if they just want to do some simple stuff. So, so what they need to do there is like make it easy to build custom apps that's cheap and can support very specific work, workflows. Um, and that can be apps that can be cheap and also then, you know, easy to throw away. If if the core supports it, you can throw it away. You know, if you, if you need to rebuild it because technology has changed, you can also throw it away. Um, and you don't need a huge budget and a big dev team. Like you need some some skill. Dev. So so trying to kind of change the, the game a bit by, by, by making app development cheaper and, and faster is, is key. The other thing that's going to be key uh, in the future is to support better custom backend microservices. We do see that a lot of these workloads we have um, are you know, typically backend oriented processing, such as data integration, data processing, uh, heavy kind of analytics jobs and so on. And we very often see that people, you know, you know the saying like, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If, if a web developer like is tasked with something, he will go and build a web app, right? Even though it shouldn't have been a web app. Um, so what we're trying to do now is to also allow in an easy way to have backend extensions so that people can build extensions and, and, and solutions that fits on the server easily on the as a backend extension. Lars, Lars, sorry, just yeah. one question while you're yeah. still on this no need for huge budget on making up generic and sustainable. What about the maintenance cost of this uh, custom, very yeah. easy to use custom apps that can yeah, yeah. be so many of them if they are very easy to, to yeah, build? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point, Christian. So like, the, 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 we're having a lot of apps now, right? And the question is like, how do we make it sustainable? And the thinking is that, and I mean, I, I know this is not, not a silver bullet, but the thinking is that if we can have a really good UI component library with com ready-made components that the core team can hopefully maintain, then that should reduce the, the level of effort for building an app. Because instead of having to develop all these components yourself, you can in theory then just take it and put it together to become an app. Um, and combined with the app platform, uh, and docs and everything, then that should reduce the costs of building an app. And if if an app is very cheap and quick to build, it, you don't really have to worry so much about maintenance. If you made like a $200,000 investment in an app, you don't want it to go away next year, right? But if you spent $5,000 or 
two thousand dollars on building an app. You know, then it doesn't really matter that much if you have to build it again in two years, right? And you don't really have to share it with five other countries or NGOs because it's cheap. So, so that is just another way of attacking this problem by. So you reducing... don't really need maintenance, you say? Yeah, you do. Yeah, you the reduce the need. It, you don't take it away, right? But you reduce the need for maintenance um, long term. That is the that is the idea. Yeah. Good good question. All right, so that is some of the thinking we have on the team now, and I think if we can pull off these two things, I think that will be a huge, huge win for, for DHS2. Yeah. All right, so switching gears. So I also want to touch a little bit on, on like software methodology. Um, and when I say software method methodology, I'm, I mean things like, you know, are we, what, what type of like development process do we have? What type of releasing do we have? What type of planning do we have? Uh, and how do we really think about how we build software? And my point is here is that many people will come and tell you that something is the best, you know? Something will tell you that you need three-year plans, you need, you know, Scrum is the best methodology, you have to use that. You know, old code should always be thoroughly tested, quarterly releases is the best. I mean, people will come up with these very kind of dogmatic opinions on, on saying what is best to do. Uh, but I think what I've, and we have learned over the years is that when you think about like how we build software, it's really a strategic choice uh, that should align with the strategic interest of your organization and the product. Um, and it also relates to the phase that the platform is in. So what I mean with this. So some of the things you should kind of then make a strategic decision on is planning. Like, do we have very long-term planning or do we have short iterations? Do we react, react to user feedback, develop something quickly, uh, be very responsive, put something out the door? Or do we say, okay, we have a three-year plan. This is the plan, like we're gonna stick with this. Do we have long release cycles? Like, do we have you know six monthly yearly releases, or do we have continuous releases where we just continue continue to release all the time? What about testing? Like, how much testing? How much effort do we spend on testing and QA versus building new things? Um, and then, do we favor like high stability over rapid change? Because you can't really have both, right? I mean, if you want to have a very stable system, you can't really change it all the time. Um, and the thing is, like, some people say you need to use agile, you need to change all the time. But the the problem with that is that if you have a very big code base then uh, if you keep changing it all the time, then it's gonna be a horrible, horrible mess over time. So, so some of these things are something you need to think about in terms of when uh, and, and in which phase is, is the platform you're trying to build. So I think if you look back at like these as to what we have done over the years, so I would say in the beginning, we, we were in kind of a startup phase, right? We only had a few developers. Uh, we didn't really have many users. We had some users in, in India, some in, in Sierra Leone, but we didn't really have many, many, many users, right? Uh, and we started up in Kenya and so on. Uh, and and we, we were trying to make it work in, in Kenya, basically. Um, and I remember that in Kenya, like we had, I think it was Morton and I, and, and Ula was a lot in, in Kenya. We, we basically just traveled around by car to the districts. We talked to the district officers in the morning, then we were driving in the evening and then we were coding and designing at night, you know, and the next morning we pushed the prod, you know, straight into production in the morning. No testing, very little testing, no CI pipelines, there were no releases, nothing. It was just like the latest version of the code pushed straight into production. That was what's really running in Kenya for, for some time. Um, and then, then people could say, okay, that's bad, you know, we need testing, uh, you need to have a release cadence and all that. But I would argue that when you are in the startup phase of a product like this, you should really focus on building the right solution. Like that is what you should just obsess about. Focus on building the right thing. That is only what matters. If you don't have any users, it doesn't matter if you have a million tests, if you have the perfect CI pipeline, right? You can have the best release cadence and, 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 and scaffolding and, and testing and everything. But if you don't have any users, that doesn't matter. Nobody's gonna use it, right? So, so in the beginning, we really focused on rapid prototyping. Um, we had frequent, or even like no releases, meaning like the latest was the release, <laughs> continuous releases. We tried to listen to users all the time. Like we, the developers were sitting with the, with the users. We tried to be responsive. We had short iterations. We pushed it out quickly. We didn't really wait. Uh, and we didn't really have any committees. We're just like, let's make a decision, move forward. Uh, and really prioritize building features over testing and stability and things. Like we just said, they're gonna be some bugs. And, and at the time I would say that was the right thing because that allowed us to to really change quickly and, and, and understand what we need to build, right? We, we got the data model pretty right. We got like the workflow pretty pretty much right. Um, and, and that was, I think the right thing to do at the time. Then after some years, we entered what I would call like the growth phase. So now, you know, it started to take off. Many countries in, in Africa started to use it, um, India and so on. 
And in this phase, you, you have to start balancing things. Like, so you have to start to, to balance uh, features and new things over stability and, and not breaking existing users and clients. So, so in that phase, it's important to focus on making the platform useful for many, like try to, to focus on scale, like get a lot of people to, to, to find value in your platform and have many people in many countries find it useful. Um, and we attack that with like generic design, trying to make it generic, flexible, uh, open-ended. Um, I would still say that in this space, was, which was like, let's say 2012 to 2016, there was still a lot of breaking changes. We still changed the data model in radical ways. We had a lot of people complain that we broke the API, especially the data model, right? We have lots of people saying, oh, you broke the API, you're bad. Um, we have to rebuild our app and, and so on and so on. Uh, but I would say that was actually the right thing to do. Um, because the, the, the reality is that change get more expensive later, right? When you have more users, more countries, more clients, more consumers, the harder change gets, the more expensive uh, change gets, right? So, so I would say you need to be able to change the system to build the right thing because you need to iterate and react to user feedback. And you should make those changes as soon as possible. Don't wait until it's too late, right? Because then you're kind of stuck with what, what yeah, I think now, now it's too late to make radical changes in the data model. Um, or yeah, I would say that because then the, the downstream effect is gonna be so huge. So, so in the growth phase, it's more like a balance where you still should allow yourself to break things, but of course, slow down a little bit and, and focus on, on stability and making people happy. And now I would say over the last you know, three, four years, when we become like this, you know, the global most adopted platform in the world, um, you know, 90 countries and so on. Now, of course, it's much more about st stability, right? So when it comes to the core platform now, it's much more about stability of the core platform um, and less about making radical changes. So what we're trying, because now people want people want stability. They don't want, they don't want bugs. They don't want things to break. They, they, they have, I think they're mostly happy with the feature set they have, many, many at least, uh, and they want to focus on stability. We're trying to balance that by pushing innovation through apps and extensions, right? So we focus a lot on like, app frameworks, app platform, accessibility, APIs, and we allow for innovation in our own apps. Of course, we have, you know, wonderful new apps like, you know, line listing and capture and then data entry and everything coming out, bringing innovation and new things without really changing the core, the backend and the APIs. And we also have the community contributing with innovations like local innovations in countries by building their own apps that don't really break the core at all because it doesn't touch what other countries are using, right? So, so trying to kind of then focus on stability of the core platform uh, and then having innovation and user prototyping and like being being responsive happening through extensions and apps. I think that is the right the right model, I would say. Yeah. So that was just a couple of thoughts on on like methodology versus and in, in relation to like the face of your product um, and, and and how it should evolve. Any super quick question there? Moving on. So from, from methodology, <laughs> touching on many things today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about like system design principles. And now I don't really talk about the software per se, but more about like how do you design the Adidas 2 system? Uh, and this is, of course, not something I've come up with. I think this is like, you know, all, all you guys here and, and the researchers and around everyone uh, come up with this. I'm trying just to summarize a little bit. So so I would say that some of the principles that have really led to success for us would be that we have always had this top-down national scale coverage approach before focusing on low level detailed data. So they always try to say, let's focus on like getting national scale before we go too deep into any kind of vertical or specialized data or, or disease or, 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 or thematic area. Uh, because we've seen over the years that in, in international development, like there's been this kind of pilotitis as they call it, right? There's, there's this famous diagram from Uganda where they have like a hundred different application apps, you know, running in different districts for this all kind of app, mobile apps, you know, web apps uh, for particular diseases. And it's only running in a couple of districts run by some NGO or something. And it's a complete nightmare to maintain. It doesn't really add any value to the national ministry of health that's trying to keep this kind of national level overview of the country uh, in terms of planning and resource allocations and monitoring. So, so, so what's set us apart from all those hundred other apps, cool apps that probably look cooler than these activities that we focus on like national scale coverage before we go too deep. Um, we did that for many years. I think now with Tracker, we're going more into like detailed data, individual data, like patient workflows and so on and so on. While what I'd like to tell us that still a lot is on paper and backlog entry. 
So, but we're taking now gradual steps into into becoming more of an individual level system. But, but I think that this has really been critical for us. I think we should not abandon that principle that we focus on national scale coverage before we go too deep. And I think Rebecca will agree there that you need to have a solid backbone, like a solid platform to build on before we do tracker, before we go into the individual specialized data streams. So getting like the basics right, aggregate data, maybe events, national level scale, solid configuration, good team, all that is critical before we move into the fancy stuff. Yeah. User participatory design, of course, critical. We know that. We always kind of try to listen to users, base base the design on real user feedback and not just sit in some, you know, meeting room somewhere and in, in, in an ivory tower and make up requirements. We always try to listen to users and, and have it be real feedback that guides us and not not I'm not gonna name names of other organizations, but we we know some that that like to dream up fancy architectures and so on. Um, and, and, and tell countries that you need this. I think we're taking the other way where we say, okay, let's listen to what the countries need and what the users say. And then we, we base it on, on that. Yeah, high flexibility, of course, talked about that already, make it configurable, but also not too configurable. Like finding the right level of flexibility is also critical, right? It's more like an art Then come back to that. Uh, integrate essential data sources. So um, that has also been a key key to the success. Uh, look at the, in the essential data sources in the country and integrate those into DHS2, either by setting it up within DHS2 as a data set or program, or by integrating it through some kind of integration. We, we know that, you know, 10 years ago when you went to a country, there was always like, there was an, a system for immunization, there was a system for HIV, there was a system for family planning, um, maternal health, you know, family, uh, all these things had their own software in the system, known forms, so on. So <clears throat> sometimes just Excel, of course, but what they did there was that we tried to integrate all those data sources to just become data sets and programs inside DHS2. And that's where we managed to integrate everything into the same system and we can do in integrated analysis. Um, if you have like functional stable systems in the country, you can also do integration, of course, to get the, the essential data sources into DHS2. But the point here is that it's more important to get the high level essential data than to get a little piece of individual specialized data. So to make efficient analysis in health, you need to have, you know, maternal health, you need to have child health, you know, you have this like different, uh, actually malaria TB and so on and so on. So try to get those together uh, and don't look at individual data, but get the aggregate data in first. That is that is like where you start. Yeah. And of course, best practice configurations. I think the metadata package has also been critical, right? You know that, that I think flexibility is great, but that also comes with the, the chance of building, doing something silly, right? You can, you can make, you can get it wrong by giving too much config configurability. So, so that we now have these kind of metadata packages that that embodies some of the best practices that's been established over the years. I think it's really good so that people can either import or at least be inspired from the best practices out there. It's kind of the same thing as the Disha2 software. It's just that now it's more almost like reuse of metadata as opposed to reuse of software. So that you can basically reuse what other people have built in, this, on, in the configuration world instead of starting from scratch. So I think all of these things have been been highly critical. Uh, Lars, um, Eric yeah. Montairo had a question for you. Eric? Shit. About the Tivana method framework. Yeah, so uh, I, 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 thanks, thanks, Lars. I, I put it in the chat as well. It was a couple of slides back when we went through the, the different phases. This one, uh, and, and especially the way you described them, and it, it sounded almost verbatim Tivana to me. Um, you know his two by two matrix of of keeping you know the core stable and then you know flexibility in the apps. Mm -hmm. So um, I, you know the question was really, did you sort of it, um, you know discover and work out those similar principles you know on your own, or was there any I don't know I guess theoretical input to this or or experience from other places or you know how do you how did these insights arrive? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, I would like to say this is not me, right? This is the team. <laughs> so this is the team. We have a lot of discussions within the, within sure, the team. Sure. So yeah. Um, but I will. I, I I certainly know that you and and Bendik have been writing about you know this this kind of dichotomy between you know heavyweight and lightweight. I read that article from Bendik where. It talks about like having a stable core, which is heavyweight and slow. And then there's like lightweight IT on the on the sides, which is like innovative and can be cheap to build and all that, which is very analogous to what we're doing with apps, right? It's almost the same thing that we have a stable core and then people build apps. So 
it's, it's very much a principle that I appreciate that's also coming up from the research side of things. Um, so I, let's say it's a mix, right? It's like experiences from the field and also listening to the research uh, team, I would say. Um, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sounds fair, fair to me. And, and, but if I can just uh, looking forward, because uh, the the implication which you also then, then repeated here with Tivana is that it you know you have increasing irreversibility. You know yeah, um, yeah. by now it, you're stuck with yeah. the core. Um, what then with uh, and, and this is the blind side of Tivana. You know with competing mm -hmm. you know platforms which yeah. possibly would have you know would need again later radical you know, is this something you discuss or are open to or think about or yeah 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 no it's a very good question so i think this is also described as the innovator dilemma right um the s curve <laughs> so the innovator exactly. dilemma yeah yeah so the innovator dilemma states that you know exactly what we talked what eric talked about now like in the beginning like you can be flexible you can adapt you can you can quickly change and you can be very sort of agile and, and aggressive but then as you get more users, you have to slow down. Uh, and that makes you a little bit vulnerable to, you know, new people, new organizations, new teams, new products coming out in the field that doesn't have the, the, um, the drawback of being having a huge, uh, huge user base. Um, so that is a very kind of classic problem that I think, I think any kind of product domain will, will face. And I think we have discussed a little bit. I think Mike sometimes likes to talk about this. You have to discuss this a little bit on the core team. We should probably talk more about it. Um, I'm actually not so, I mean, it, it's a dangerous thing to say, but I'm actually not so worried about that right now because I feel like when it comes to like HMIS health platforms, I think DHS2 is quite far away from the next in line. There's almost isn't any competition in that space. A lot of competition in EMRs and mobile apps, but not in this HMIS space. I, I don't really see anyone kind of attacking that position in the near future. Um, and I think that as, as we kind of, we, we still main, I mean, the, even though we have a monolith, we, we still manage to, you know, build new things. We, we can be flexible. We can still put out new features every six months. There's continuous releases of web apps. It's not like the code base has reached a level where it's too hard to change it. So, and we spend a lot of time on cleaning up the code base, you know, adding tests, refactoring. We had this massive uh, code modernization project uh, some years ago that's kind of still ongoing, but um, in a couple of months, we're going to get rid of the struts and going to move to like pure React based front end. So, we do spend a lot of time on modernizing the code base and the architecture. We'll probably spend more, but I think the, um, that that helps in terms of like allowing us to still be, be a little bit agile. Um, but yeah, I will say we also should be aware of this and, and look at blind sides, like you said. And if something radical comes up, you know, if it's AI or if it's, you know, whatever this. In terms of on the technology side, like we could be a little bit more vulnerable, so we need to we need we need to keep an eye on that. That was a, that was a very good question. Okay, continue. Yeah. Russia. Okay. So moving towards the end. Um, okay. So a couple of like high level software design principles. Uh, again, nothing shocking here, but. We're going to talk about some more like low level uh, principles, but first some high level principles. So, so I would say like some of the success factors here have been that these two can facilitate the entire data flow. So from, from data capture and data import, data management, validation, and also analytics visualization. We see that um, in other spaces, like in, in a typical, you know, private sector or whatever, the typical way to do things is that you have, you know, one system for data capture, like some, some kind of survey or data collection system then you have some kind of data lake you know in the cloud or something where you do validation and then you have like a bi tool or like a bi platform that that do the visualization like power bi or tableau whatever uh, but the problem there is that gluing these things together is actually very hard you know if you have the disparate data sources that comes in as you know csv files or whatever trying to kind of harmonize and join as they call it and harmonize all those data sources to become a uniform and integrated uh, piece of analysis, un unified like data repository that can be used for integrated analysis. It's actually very complicated. Uh, it requires a data engineer, I would say, that knows how to do transformation and cleaning and data lakes and things, uh, which, you know, not easy, not trivial still. So I think that the fact that we basically allow, you know, we do all these three things together and we have this design where all the data basically ends up in one table in the database, which makes it very easy. It makes it hard, a little bit hard to get the data in, 
but once it's in, it's actually quite easy to analyze uh, in an integrated way. Uh, and I think countries really appreciate that, that they don't have to kind of set up different systems. They don't have to hire a data engineer, data scientist to kind of bring all these data sources together. It's once you get like the, the data in, import process uh, going, once you set up your forms, it's actually very easy to integrate data. So, so that I think has been a, a key to the success that they keep it simple and avoid like complex, making life complex and, and having these complicated data merging and joining operations. Um, yeah, and generic design, talked about that many times. Open source, of course, has been critical. Um, you know, there's, there's a number of like projects and software that's gone under because they were very dependent on project financing so that when, you know, the project funding ran out, the, the, the software basically ended. But I mean, these do still cost money to implement, but the, the open source license, of course, reduces the dependency on like time specific funding. So that's even though like some funding runs out, the, the country can still you know, keep it, keep the lights on and, and keep the, keep the project. Uh, accessibility, we talked about that one also. It's very key, of course, make it easy to integrate with other systems because we would like to integrate system, uh, you know, data sources as much as possible. Scalability, I think has been key. Make it work at the national global level before focusing on details. I'm trying to say that it doesn't matter if you add a feature that makes the software slow, because if you do that, nobody, you don't really have a system, right? If you're adding a feature that, makes the system three times slower, that's that's really helpful. Maybe in a, you know, at, at individual data level, that doesn't really help because now the, the entire system doesn't work. So focus on scalability first, performance first, um, I think it's been key because now we can use the system at the, at the country level. And of course, like hosting anywhere has also been critical. I think that we do support on-prem hosting. I think, you know, obviously many countries like it or not, like they, they, they prefer to host in country and, and not have the data in the cloud. And then they should be allowed to do that and own their own system, right? So some of, some of the competitors we have, they only support like managed cloud, host, cloud hosting. That's been a major, major problem, I think, for some of them. Um, of course, that increases the, the work we have to do because supporting multiple versions and supporting on-premise installations is much more complicated than just if we had you know one cloud environment to support. But it's definitely worth it. It's been, been key of the success. At the same time, it's also, of course, possible to host in the cloud and there's also managed hosting. So organizations that just want to sign up without hosting, they can also do that. So this having this spectrum of hosting options, I think has also been critical to the success. Okay, so last section. Um, well, there's also discussion, right? Just a couple of points on like software or product design principles. And now I'm talking more about how to design features and behavior within the system. So I just want to state, first of all, real user needs and inputs are the foundation of product design. So we talked about this already. Focusing on real user needs is really critical. Like don't, don't sit in a meeting room and make up your requirements. It's really be based on, on real, real user needs. And having people like we have that's been spent a lot of time in the field has been critical. Because like when you go to the field for a long time, you, you start to get this implicit understanding of what people actually need and what type of users do we have, right? So so being close to the users, understanding users, that's of course the, the basis. One, this is maybe one of my favorite principles. <laughs> um, when we try to design software, we always we should try to focus on having people tell us their problem and not their solution. We see this a lot. So if, you, if you've been part of some of these design sessions, if you talk to you know, users in the field, you will realize that they always try to tell you their solution instead of telling you their problem. So they will tell you that. Oh, we need, you know, we need to be able to, to do this with data elements and download to Excel and we have to do this and that. Um, and they come up with the solution in their, in their mind on how they would have designed the solution based on what they know. So when we try to talk to users, we should also be aware that we should focus on the underlying problem uh, and not the, necessarily the solution that people present. Sometimes the solution is good, but often it's not. Uh, so the users really sit with the knowledge about the problem, but I think software engineers are usually better to devise solutions to the problems. So so trying to peer, peel back a bit the layers and understand the underlying problem is, is really critical instead of jumping on a solution that comes out. So that takes time and skills, but, but I think that is absolutely critical and not just say yes to what that people say, but, but really analyze what, what they're trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, okay, this is a quote. This is like a meta quote, um, which I also like. Um, it's kind of portrayed as being said by Henry Ford, but it's actually not said by Henry Ford, the inventor of, of Ford Motors. <laughs> uh, but it's a good quote anyway, so, so I'll be using it anyway. So the quote says, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse, right? So 
this is kind of symptomatic sometimes when you do user research is that if you ask people what they want, they very much think within the boundaries of their existing knowledge, right? Of their existing understanding of the system. So if they know DHS2 and you ask them what they want, they will say, oh, I want it to be a bit faster. I want, you know, one more option in the pivot tables. I would like the solution to be this and this. Um, it's kind of hard for end users to really innovate, right? To come up with something completely new. But I think that I, I, I am a kind of a strong believer in incremental improvement, right? I think the majority of what they do should be incremental improvements, like listening to users, making it a little bit better every time. But I think that we also need to be aware that if you do that forever, you know, you might miss some opportunities. You know, there might be new technology, there might, there might be some radical new ways of doing things that they might miss out on. So I think that we also need to kind of step, take a step back. And I think what Eric also alluding to is that there are often there like every for every like five or 10 years or so, there will be a new shift in technology. There will be new platforms, new opportunities that come out. Um, and we need to focus on that and see if we can kind of leapfrog a bit and, and, and make some real innovation as opposed to only doing incremental improvements. Nothing wrong with that, but we also need to focus on sometimes every now and then making some, some radical innovation. Okay, next one. <clears throat> next one. So if you try to please everyone, you won't please anyone. This is also, I think, a very important principle. So as these two developers, we get a lot of requests, right? There's a ton of requests coming right, left, and center. Uh, and people ask you for all kinds of stuff. We, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to join to this domain. We need to go into that domain. We need to support this. If you only have this feature, we can do this, et cetera. So the thing is like, people ask you to do a lot, but I think the paradox is that if you say yes to absolutely every request, eventually nobody I think will actually use your platform. If you're trying to say yes to everything, if you have like a thousand features here and there, the, the, the kind of the problem is that, the paradox is that your platform will become so complex that eventually nobody's gonna use it. It's gonna be so complicated that people will just throw their hands up and say, this is too much for me, I don't want this, can't use it. So while we do wanna be responsive to users and we wanna say yes, and we wanna to listen to users, it's also important to say no every now and then, to say, I hear you, but we can't do everything. We can't do absolutely everything because we're not really doing anyone a favor by adding a million features to DHS2. We need to focus on like what's critical, what's, what do we think is most critical for DHS2 and focus on that. And we shouldn't jump into every little, you know, specific domain, specific feature, specific system. We should try to stay core to, to what we think is most important to us. And that means saying no. Saying no isn't bad. Saying no is actually good for, for the people who ask uh, in the long run. So that is a paradox, but I think it's really critical that you're not, you're not kind of doing, you're not always doing people a disservice by saying no. You might actually be doing that person a favor. You should say yes to critical things that, that really make sense and aligns with your platform, but you should say no to things that's on the uh, periphery of what you're trying to do. Yeah, okay. And then quick one, benefit of a feature should justify the added user interface and code base complexity. So this is also about feature prioritization and deciding on what to do. So again, when people come and ask us to build a feature, we should also, we always think through what is the added complexity of the UI and the code base for this? Like, are we making something that's horribly complicated to use and maintain? Or not, and I think that's at least my experience over the time is that like open-ended features give you the most value in the long run, right? So, so building things which are kind of not very specific to a very particular disease or particular domain, but building things which are open-ended and can be used by many, and that's easy to understand and easy to kind of build and grasp and, and, and understand by looking at the UI. Those things tend to have the most value over time because. You know, there's been a number of these requests from people say, oh, we have to go into the, this very particular disease for mosquitoes and classifications and things. Um, but that never really took off. You know, then you're only helping a few people. But at the cost of improving the you know, complexity of the UX, improve, like uh, extending the, the complexity of the configuration and also you know, the complexity of the code base. So again, tr trying to keep it simple, Keep it simple, keep it relatively open-ended so it's easy to use. That tend to give the, the most value over the long run, uh, at least in my, my experience. Okay, quick word on, on generic, back to generics. So being generic is very much about abstractions. So in my opinion, like abstractions should be generic enough to be useful for many and also specific enough to be useful at all. So what that means is that you really need to strike the right level of abstractions. So, being generic, you can also be too generic, right? If you're building flexibility, 
that nobody needs, that nobody really uses, that's bad because now you're adding on the complexity, you make the system harder to use. Um, it doesn't really add any value, but you're just getting the added code base complexity and, and user complexity. So, 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 and again, if you, if you make it too generic, it also might not be useful, right? If you're making it so generic that nobody knows how to use it, it, it becomes pointless. Um, so that's really a balance. You need to strike the balance between being generic and also being a little bit specific. One example is like the org hierarchy in DSA2 is very specific, right? It's very particular to org. It's not like just a list. Um, or some of the things to build are a little bit specific to like the way things are done in health and maternal health and so on, especially tracker is a little bit geared towards maternal health, child health, because that is like the majority of the use cases. So you need to support your key use cases uh, enough, but also of course not, not don't make it so, so specific that it becomes not possible to use it for other domains as well. So the striking the right level of abstraction is really key. Uh, and that, that requires a little bit of thinking, of course. Okay, and <clears throat> towards the end, this is my favorite quote of all times, start simple. That is always the important thing. When we build things, we should not try to build something very complicated from the get-go. Like all complex solutions start simple. You have to start somewhere. So instead of trying to kind of make up what people want, you should start simple, build what you know, and then get it out. And my preferred way of building software would be build what you know is right, then just release it, get feedback, and then you repeat. Right. So if you have this process, when you, you kind of gather information about what you know you need to build, you, you, you gather information about what you know people want, you build that, you release it, you get feedback, you just keep repeating that. If you do that consistently, um, you actually reduce the risk of, of making the wrong choice a lot. That reduces the risk, I would say, of, of software design and a lot of making huge mistakes. And especially now that we have such a widely adopted platform, we can't really you know, afford to make major mistakes. So we have to kind of understand that what we're doing and, and have some kind of confidence in that we're building the right thing. So by doing this in principle, I think is, is yeah, reduces risk and increases the chance of building the right thing. Yeah, so just a couple of reasons why we start simple. You shouldn't make too many assumptions. Like if, you, if you're building something very complicated from, the, from scratch, you're making a lot of assumptions about what people want. Building too much increases risk of building the wrong thing. It's a high mental load for, for developers. And we often see that users don't know what they want until they actually see it, right? It's hard for people to kind of conceptualize um, complicated solutions. Like if you go into a room of five people and you ask for a complicated solution, there will be five different pictures in people's head, right? So, so people really like to look at real software and then you can iterate and build on new things in small pieces, yeah. So innovation really comes from prototyping, iterations and getting feedback, right? That looking at real software really stimulates the mind and makes it easy for people to, to understand exactly how things work. Okay. So um, I don't know how we are on time. Uh, I think we can move over to the, the uh, discussion part now. Uh, I don't know, Kristen, Yonda, do we want to do any questions? Do we want to talk yeah, about Can challenges? you tell like, a question that maybe uh, also allude to your mm -hmm. challenges? Because you know we need to go yeah. into the challenge. Yeah. So Knut, can you tell the question yourself? Um, yeah, for, um, so um, Lars, um, one thing we we have, but it hasn't been really developed very much is the relationship model. Hmm. It's kind of been hanging there for, for years. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but in principle, and I'm not saying we should do this, but I'm saying in principle, it could, allow you to have a virtual entity relationship thing where you, you kind of build your own tracker yeah. model, right? I mean, yeah. if you have many, many relationships, then it can become super complex, obviously. Mm. So just what, what are your thoughts regarding, because that would allow us possibly to, to you know, go into more e-government things and do more, do more uh, complicated uh, workflows. Hmm. in principle, but maybe yeah. it's stupid. So yeah, what's your <laughs> thoughts? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and I, maybe this is Mike and Marcus territory and maybe you should let them answer. But I think your point is good that in theory, like if we had a more kind of built out relationship model and relationship, we're not talking about tracker, right? Track entity, track entities and how they relate to each other. And um, you're right that, I mean, if we had a better like relationship model that was kind of built out more, you could also model more complex use cases, right? You can build this kind of, like you said, it's virtual 
entity diagram pretty much you can you can say okay here's an entity here's an entity and this is how they relate almost like a database diagram right um, and it could support a lot by doing that um, so I agree the, 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 the cost is of course that this becomes very very complex when it comes to like using that data we know that we have struggled a lot to build like a good relationship analytics interface um, because you can you can imagine it, it becomes almost like a like a graph right like a graph database where for analytics purposes, you need to ask questions like how many people have a relationship with that type of entity and how many siblings and how many people are in that entity and adding filters on the different entities, navigating the graph and so on. And it's that's to me like, it's almost like a graph database. It's almost like a new product to do all that stuff. Uh, it could be very complicated to get that right and do it well. Um, I think that's just um, the, the reason why we haven't moved more on that is that it's, it's hard to, to get right and it's a lot of work. Uh, but I do agree in principle that if we can do something like that, it, it could really open up for new opportunities, if that's what we want, <laughs> like like e-governance, et cetera. So how, how, do, how, how, do we how do we find out how far we want to push that? Uh, <laughs> how do you think we should approach it? Uh, well, like, I think slowly? we should, yeah. Well, I, I think, yeah, it's a good, I don't know. Uh, I think we should collect, first of all, start by collecting, you know, some, some, not user stories, but collect some requirements. Like, what are we trying to achieve? Give some examples of what we would like to support. That is, is always good to look at something real. So try to collect some, some information and background on like what we're trying to do, like what we're trying to support. That would be a very good start. And then we could sit with the the the, the team and and see how feasible it is to support some of this, uh, and how we weight according uh, against like existing priorities. I, I would say that's the best way. Engage the tracker team. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So some of the challenges, and I think there's lots of challenges, right? There's a lot of challenges. And I think we can open up a discussion now and talk for a long time as usual. But I think some of the challenges that I see would be like one, data use. I think still data use isn't exactly where it needs to be. Like having people that regularly use data at the district level, facility level to improve outcomes, to improve planning, resource allocation, that kind of stuff. We we need to improve and also like document the outcomes better so they can come back to the donors and explain, okay, people are actually making an impact because, you know, people are starting to think like, okay, we're making these huge investments, uh, but what is the impact, right? What are we getting at? So focusing and finding maybe even new ways to, to, to improve data use, uh, I think is going to be, be critical. And that, that's, that's a multifaceted approach against, you know, software implement, implementations, configuration, training, et cetera. Another big problem is, and I think Ulav and Rebecca will agree that metadata management over time, that is a big problem. We see that some countries like South Africa, for instance, which is very mature, they have these kind of review processes every year and they keep things super tidy. In other countries, we see that there's very little discipline when it comes to metadata management. People just put in new data sets all the time. People don't reuse data elements. People don't reuse category options. So we're creating a lot of duplication and there's like five, five data elements called Malaria and there's six categories called under one. Et cetera. So, and and there's no clear naming convention. There's no there's no kind of review of what forms should be in the HMIS and so. And you end up with this messy database that people don't really know how to use. We heard many people say that that's, you know, I would like to look at malaria data, but there's five elements called malaria, and none of them are like national coverage. I don't know how to do it. So so making it more disciplined, like making giving more structure, more governance around metadata management. Is going to be key and again this is like a software issue training issue capacity building issue um fragmentation of country systems and this is an interesting i think what we see now in many places is that there's a lot of these two popping up now in different countries i think rwanda is the you know glowing example where where <laughs> there's a lot of these to both ministry of health is running is running a lot of these installations and there's also like agent different agencies like usaid and cdc and the ngos and whatnot that also come up with their own digital instances in parallel. So, and of course that becomes a nightmare because people don't really think about interability from the beginning. So they end up with like different org hierarchies with different codes and there's different codes, data elements and things. And it's, we have this open JE thing that doesn't really work. And then like bringing all this data together at the end of the day is becoming hard. Uh, and as Jörn likes to say that this is kind of interesting because <laughs> in the beginning, in the early days, like Disha 2 tried to fix this problem, right? By bringing together all these different systems into one so we can have integrated analysis. Now people are actually starting to move us back to the same place and having the same problems just by using many DHS2 installations. And then that opens up a little bit of 
of space for, for others like Senesis and others to attack us and say, we can build these beautiful integrated dashboards of all your all your digital installations on top of, of the mess, right? So we need to figure out like how to govern, like how many digital installations should a country really have? And if they really need many, like there should be some kind of higher level data warehouse on top of this that can pull in again, integrated uh, data sources. So we can look at the integrated analysis across this stuff because it, it tends to grow out of control a little bit, in, at least in some countries that I've seen. And the last one, uh, not the last one, but on this slide, um, applying research and software development. Um, I think that we have a lot of potential when it comes to aligning the, um, the research team at the University of Oslo with the dev team. Uh, I sometimes like to say that, you know, the DC2 core team probably has the largest R&D department in Norway when it comes to tech organizations, but I don't think they're using it a lot. Um, so we need to find a way where some of the research that's being done actually can kind of feed back into the software design and development. Uh, and I think you should make research more actionable, also more applicable, and also more easy to understand so that the software team can really understand. It can be hard for the software team to read some of these very academic papers. So, so, so finding a way for, for information from, from, from the research to flow into the software design would be, would be very good. So with that, I'll stop. And uh, Jörn had some, um, some points that I've just put up here. And if there's any questions uh, or else we can start the discussion.